your, say your first name and your question. Hi, I'm Mark, and I come from a very naive place, but I'd like to, I, my sense was that this clinic in East Vancouver was not a government-funded entity at all. So what I'd like to get a handle on is what are the relative proportions of government-funded programs like this, free needles, places where people can inject where there's Narcan around, versus people having to take it upon themselves in the private sector. So in other words, is the public sector being mobilized in such a way that you know there's an effective ability Thank you. Who wants to take the question? Sure. Uh, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, just before we begin, I'd like to, um, for the audience that's here and also the audience that's going to be viewing this on the tape version, I, I would like uh, to just, I'd like us all to join in one reverent moment of silence for the loved and the loving ones that have been taken from us. So please join me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, Ken and I'll, I'll let us take you to pop in, I hope, in a couple of minutes. Um, so the question is, does the public sector meaning the establishment, the government? And I think um, the staff member at Overdose Prevention Society at the end on the phone said, when are the people at the top going to say, we've had enough and do whatever we can or whatever they can to do something about this? And that's the sentiment I would like to reflect right now. <clears throat> We have a state where we have millions of dollars flowing in every month from opioid settlement, um, the class action suit, it's not taxpayer money. We have a city here in Burlington, which is basically, and I'm sorry to say, it's the epicenter of death. We have one death a week in Sydney County and they're concentrated in downtown Burlington. We have our prime mayor and our current mayor advocating for an overdose prevention center. We have a city council that has had three re re uh, resolutions. Governor Scott to not veto H72, which he vetoed. We have the state's attorney, Sarah George, in favor of an overdose prevention center. We used to have the attorney general, J.J. Donovan, who's no longer the Attorney General in favor of an overdose prevention center. Jess has worked at a, a safe syringe program and now works for Vermont's uh, for criminal justice reform. They did a research study a number of years ago and 93% of the people that used the safe syringe program were eager to use an overdose prevention center. In Vermont, right now, as I speak, we have 872 veto. Monday will tell whether we can overturn the veto. We have a puzzle in Vermont, and we have every piece in that puzzle. We don't have the political will to put the pieces together. I'll just add that, you know, this has become a bigger conversation in the last year or two, but there are a lot of people that have been working on this for many years. There's, you know, been, legislative pushes for many years. I testified, um, you know, in support of overdose prevention centers from my own lived experience. I have a personal lived experience. I've ex experienced multiple overdoses myself. I've reversed many overdoses. I have worked in harm reduction for 10 years. Um, and I know with my, like, entire heart and mind that this is absolutely the, the thing that we need in Burlington and that we're really missing in order to save lives. And there are a lot of people that uh, have put in a lot of work to, you know, study all the prevention centers. We know that they're effective. We know that they save lives. We know that they bring people into services in a really big way. It's the true definition of meeting people where they're at more than any other 
strategy in harm reduction or treatment, in my opinion. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of people that are really ready to implement this um, in a well thought out way that will help our community and help keep people fed. So, Kaylin, you've been implementing OPC. Do you feel like you want to maybe tell people like what, what you think it needs to stand up and, and doable or not, friends? <laughs> Well, I have to confess, I, I didn't actually hear the initial question. I think it was around whether public resources could be used for OPCs and what public resources could be used. Was, was that the question, essentially? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, OK. I, I just wanted to add one thing to that. Um, you can hear me OK, I hope. Yes, we can, Kelly. Very weird to not be able to see any of you. Oh. <laughs> Um, but I trust that you're out there and I'm not just talking to um, Ed and Jess. Um, so the New, the New York model, as it's being called, is um, innovative in a few different ways. Uh, one, of course, is its um, lack of formal or traditional legislative and regulatory framework. Um, as I'm sure is, is very obvious to you and, and you are aware, we don't have state authorization to operate these sites. In fact, really all we have and all we have ever had is a letter of commitment from New York City Department of Health and, uh, and the mayor. Um, when we first launched in November 2021, no public funds could be used for the activities that occurred inside the OPC. Um, we had to rely on discretionary and foundation money only. Um, and then, you know, as time went on, we wanted opioid settlement fund money and Governor Hochul would not allow opioid settlement funds to flow towards the site. However, uh, the municipality in New York City advocated very hard uh, for public funds uh, to, to flow to our sites. And what we have in place now is something called a time and effort structure. And I always mention it because I think some of these jurisdictions that are getting ready to launch OPCs really get stuck on the state permissions uh, aspect of things and access to the opioid settlement fund money. And New York is an example that you can proceed without the state uh, as long as you've got strong backing from your local elected officials, particularly the mayoral office, local PD, uh, and your health department. So a time and effort structure, just to tell you very quickly, because um, it's kind of interesting, honestly, is, uh, oh, thanks, I can see you. You're all sitting so far away. Very typical of an audience. Um, okay, a time and effort structure. Essentially, it looks at the percentage of staff time spent in an OPC, and it cuts out the staff time spent conducting activities that violate federal law. In an OPC, the only activity that violates federal law, and this is, there is even some legal question that this is true, is the observation of consumption. And having run consumption programs uh, in Canada and the United States now for the last 20 years, I can tell you with so much confidence that staff don't spend that much time observing the act of consumption. Everything else that staff does uh, is considered uh, an evidence-based public health intervention for people with substance use disorder. And it's just 2% of staff time that cannot be paid for using public dollars. So the burden on the organization to have discretionary funds to pay for that 2% uh, is obviously much more manageable than having to pay for 100% of staff time in that program. So that's how we do it without state approval and without access to opioid settlement funds. Um, and it can be done. Thank you, Kaylin. <clears throat> Thank you, Kaylin. Jess and Ed, you have a follow-up question? Yeah, just clarification. So um, my question would be is, is that in contrast to what was just described in New York City, are you folks saying that in the absence of state approval, the, the local municipality, like the city of Burlington, like Chittenden County, cannot authorize funds to open OPCs? The, the, the funds are uh, included in H-72, and the funds included in H-72 come from the opioid settlement with the Purdue family and different types of uh, distributors. The way it's set up in the proposal, in the legislation, is the money will come 
through uh, the city of, of, of Burlington. Um, the, the problem is that the, the bill has been vetoed. It's the second bill that had overdose prevention centers in it. The first one was merely a study group. The bill has uh, been vetoed. We'll know more Monday afternoon whether or not the bill will be, uh, the veto will be overridden. If the bill also uh, provides, not to get too weedy about it, but it provides for immunity for who owns the building, the people who work there, people using the facility, coming in with drugs that are still illegal, that, that this would be, be allowed. And, um, you know, so if, if the bill doesn't pass, unlike New York, it doesn't seem like this will go, this will go anywhere in Vermont. We need, that, we need that legislation. Thank you. Ed. Any, any, Callan, Jess, do you want anything to add to that? Or take another question from the... Uh, Audience here. <clears throat> Thank you. I um, my name is Milo Gran. I'm city councilor for the Central District. And prior to being city councilor, I was a police commissioner, um, begging for help for the Central District because what's happening in Burlington hit us first. Uh, it's been very, very difficult to, to watch how this has exploded and now to see what's going on downtown. It's now being taken more seriously because a certain class of people are being more effective now. Uh, and we really need to be honest about that. We were just having a discussion about othering and that is something that's really happening in our community. Um, I have a question, but I also just want to say, with regards to the veto, there's going to be a vote to see if we, our legislature can overturn that veto. And uh, Thomas Chittenden, who represents Chittenden County, has not been supportive. So. Everybody here needs to email him. You need to get your friends, family to email him because we have to have, if we don't have our whole legislation, a legislative representation of Chittenden County on board, how can we expect anybody else in the state? And if you have time to email people who are known not to be um, supportive because it's really important. Uh, what I would love to know from Kaylin C was um, you had last year attended one of our CompStat meetings and the thing that struck me that was so important and what people get scared of is that they fear that th there will be more crime when an OPC works, opens up. And I was wondering if you could talk about some of the data that's available. And then also, I was really impressed with the examples you gave with regards to how you work with local law enforcement. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think this is the room who will know Brandon Del Pozo very well. Um, and I believe he was a uh, police commissioner there at one time uh, and has since moved into research and is now with Brown University. Um, and I will, I'll put this in the chat, but uh, he recently with his colleagues published a paper on crime uh, stats around the OPCs in New York showing no discernible increase in crime and marked decreases in certain areas, including an 87% decrease in arrests, uh, lower gun crimes, uh, a, a really stark, don't quote me on the number, I'll have to go back and check, but a very stark decrease in EMS activations around overdose, medical-related EMS calls, um, and certainly no increase in crime. Uh, this is consistent with research about overdose prevention centers in other parts of the world. I, I think what is often kind of conflated is um, what we bring to the neighborhood and what was already there and what we are trying to work with alongside law enforcement and emergency services. It's, it's, it's our sort of intentions are not at cross purposes. We are in essence really trying to do the same thing. And On Point is a big believer in um, 
sort of usefulness and we call it the philosophy of usefulness and how can we be useful to PD? What pieces of work can we take off their plates? They are already extremely overburdened. These, these are um, city agencies across the country that I think we can say are still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. They have really high rates of um, uh, vacancies uh, across law enforcement and emergency services. People are working double, triple shifts. They're tired, they're poorly resourced. They don't wanna be dealing with low level drug, crime, drug crimes and they don't wanna be dealing with mental health calls. A supervised consumption facility can take that piece of work off of law enforcement's plate to a large degree, especially when you're working in collaboration. Uh, and that's what we've tried to do for the precincts where we operate, uh, both in uh, Harlem and Washington Heights. Uh, some other sort of benefits of our strange bellow, bedfellows kind of relationship is um, changes in drug trends and drug supply trends in the neighborhood. We know what's in the drug supply in East Harlem and Washington Heights before the State Department of Health or the precinct. And we're able to flag for the officers anything that is going to impact them on the street. Uh, the adulterants can produce different behaviors and if the uh, officers are aware to expect those behaviors, we tend to have uh, lower instances of police brutality and over policing because they're expecting it and they know what it is and we're able to give them feedback on how to handle it. We also do joint outreach together. Uh, law enforcement never gets good PR. It's very good PR for them to be seen out with a community-based organization working together, especially on this issue. Um, it's also good for us uh, in many ways to be seen to be working alongside the police. Um, it, it helps sort of demystify them as, as much as it does demystify us. Um, we also help them, uh, this is a little bit of a sad uh, part of our partnership, but we help work through their DOA backlog because often we are able to identify those folks um, faster than they are. Um, the other thing that we do together is um, talk about this. Uh, when we first launched, um, I was insistent on getting something in writing from NYPD at the top of the top, the brass saying protection from prosecution, indemnification, all of these kinds of things. Of course, they couldn't put anything on paper because we don't have federal authorization to operate these sites. But what they did say to us is, what do you want? Do you just want us nowhere near the site? You don't want us on the block at all? Uh, and of course we said, absolutely not. You have to continue to do community policing. What we don't want is for you to impede the ability of the sites to succeed. And if people are scared to use it because you're sitting outside warrant poaching, they are not gonna work and we are not gonna be able to take this piece of work off your plate. And that, that they really understood. Um, the partnership deepened to the point where uh, NYPD asked us to produce a card indicating that we were working together. So when they found somebody using outside, or uh, you know, in distress on the street, rather than arrest them, they would show the card and say, let us bring you over to On Point. So we've really developed a very low threshold diversion program without even knowing that's what we were doing together. Uh, and, and it's working really beautifully in New York. Thank you. All right, who's next? We have another question? All right, well, seeing that, I'll, I'll fill some space here. And I'm gonna put Councillor Grant on the spot here, uh, being that she was on the uh, police commission. And I think it was insightful, uh, you know, Ed bringing up with H72 and how the funding is coming out of the opioid settlement uh, by way of our friends, the Sacklers, you know, all the people who ended up in this situation because they did nothing more than simply get their prescription filled, um, which is, you know, something that I had learned along the way. My, my journey on this is when I first heard about these, I was kind of like, this this doesn't seem like a very good idea at all. I think Ronnie kind of said it pretty pretty well in the, uh, um, in the film, but as I learned more about it and realized it's like, we're not trying to cure all of the society, so we're simply trying to keep people alive here. Because at the end of the day, Treatment's not an option when you're dead. So keeping people alive and building relationships, and I think we saw from the film too, you know, at a, this is an overdose prevention center at a minimum. But, you know, what we saw here is a place for people to come, uh, build meaningful connections, build community, find it, get out of the, you know, the elements, get some shelter, um, you know, and build a little bit of a community and do things there. So I think it's more than that. And when I've talked to folks out on the street that have been struggling with houselessness and stuff, that's one of the, th the refrains I've heard a lot is like, you know, I, I feel like people don't see me. I feel like abandoned. It's just 
the sense of, of not really belonging and having an OPC where people can come together, uh, people who understand each other and have the same shared experience, I think it's really powerful to make people realize that you know I'm not the only one going through this or other people, and they can lean on each other for support. So, um, And I bring that up because I know here in Burlington, I think it was fiscal 23 council grant when our uh, first responder budget was like three times over the allocated amount because we had a, a spike in, in overdoses that we had had not anticipated. So from a fiscal perspective, it seems to me like if we had an overdose prevention center, you know, as my grandmother was fond to say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if we can get people into an OPC and keep them alive and, re and reduce the overdose, that's going to have a direct impact on our city's bottom line. So I think that, you know, that's another um, a reason why we should be really like looking in this uh, direction, um, not only because it saves lives and builds community, but because it has you know positive impacts on the community. So I won't ramble on. I could do for for quite some time now. So we do have another question, which is the intent. So let me. One thing to that. Yes, absolutely. Saving money. Um, so we've intervened in New York City in sixteen hundred overdoses so far so far since we launched, and we've called EMS. Um, under 50 times, 1,600 overdoses and less than 50 EMS calls. I just think about that money. Think about it. None of those people ended up in the emergency room. None of them. It was all triaged effectively by the staff at On Point. They did their full recovery there. They were provided overdose aftercare counseling. They were connected to medical care, addiction treatment services, et cetera, whatever they might need without leaving the building. I don't know what it's like in Vermont, but in New York City, when an overdose call comes through 911, police are also dispatched. And what I am telling you is that the money that we have saved just the emergency services in the hospital system is estimated to be around $50 million, between 30 and $50 million, and our evaluation is looking at that cost savings to give an accurate number, and that doesn't include cost savings to NYPD. Before we had the Overdose Prevention Center, when we called 911 for an overdose call, it was not unusual because of the fentanyl task force for up to 11 officers to show up, two detectives and several cars, that's a lot of money. And that doesn't happen anymore. Um, so there's, there's huge, huge cost savings to several city stakeholder agencies. Um, certainly EMS, the hospital system, NYPD, sanitation department, because of our outreach and public safety teams and all of this uh, sort of drug paraphernalia and syringe litter diversion that we're doing. Since launch, we've diverted over 2 million units of hazardous waste from parks and public spaces in New York City that sanitation or the parks department did not have to deal with and nor did their unionized workforces who don't want to deal with that. The sort of the downstream benefits to the neighborhood uh, of an overdose prevention center uh, are, are really quite, quite broad and they certainly are more broad than, than just the very obvious life-saving benefit uh, for the people who use them. Thank you, Kellen. My name's Lori, and um, one of my questions is, um, is your experience in New York, and I'm wondering about um, the possibility if this could happen in Burlington, with people um, having more opportunity to go into treatment through your service, and I know it's, it's like a fine line uh, in terms of people not being ready for that, but I'm just wondering, given the community, the support, are you finding a higher um, percentage of people going into treatment than before you opened? And I don't know if we're talking about that in Burlington as well, but. Is that, that's a question for me? Well, for both of you, really, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this is a hard one. Um, especially in the United States, where sort of the success of an OPC must be sober people. Um, and I, I think we're in a room uh, of, of souls who understand it's not quite that simple. Uh, we have over 4,500 people registered to both OPCs in New York, um, about 4,000 of them in Harlem, and about 1,500 in Washington Heights. Washington Heights is mostly unhoused, street entrenched, encampment dwelling, speedball injectors, and they're fairly young, so they are very chaotic population. 
Harlem is a little bit older, a little wiser. They've been around the block a few times. High volume inhalation population, uh, lots of smoking, uh, tend to be sort of mixed housing status. A hundred percent of them, every single one of those over 4,500 people has been through traditional treatment modalities many, 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 many times. Some of them upwards of 20, 30 times. This includes uh, buprenorphine, methadone, long-term treatment, detoxification, cold turkey, you name it, they've tried it. What we is true at On Point is anybody who wants treatment gets it immediately, again, without having to leave the OPC. And what's beautiful about the OPC is the idea of booth side care. You suddenly have this unprecedented level of access to a population nobody can get their hands on. Um, average duration of a visit to Harlem is 38 minutes. Average duration to a visit in Washington Heights is 55. When you start to imagine that you see people multiple times a day, you can see cumulatively in one day how much time we spend with these folks. Treatment and addiction treatment comes up a lot. And we take advantage of every opportunity that it comes up. With an OPC though, it, looks a lot, it can look a lot of different ways. Initially, the impetus of the OPC is safety, engagement, and stabilization. The first things you gotta do is get people off the street and into the room. From there, you work with people to pull them out of survival drug use patterns, those peak and valley drug use patterns. When they come out of that and they're more stable and they're engaging with something that looks a little bit more like maintenance use, from this platform, the rest is possible. Suddenly the likelihood of being more successful in an abstinence-based program goes through the roof. You're a better candidate for housing. You're a better candidate for employment. You're a better parent to your kids. All of this comes from a platform of stability and really engaging people making sure them sa they're safe and bringing them out of survival drug use patterns is a big part of recovery for this population. Thank you. I, I imagine that's what you presented, you know, to the legislature to, you know, in your hearings. And I guess my next question, you know, if you want to speak to that, but also why, after all we've heard, would the governor veto this? I mean, it seems like it's evidence-based yeah. to me, but. Yeah, that one I can't answer. Yeah. I don't know why the governor vetoed this, um, but uh, we really hope for an override. And um, yes, I mean, treatment will be absolutely offered in any OPC that is, you know, operating in Vermont or Burlington. Um, and, you know, I just think, you know, Kaylin is laying it down with exactly like what we hope for in terms of, you know, like what, what we want to see at an OPC here. And, you know, working in syringe exchange for a really, you know, long time and still being in harm reduction work and working with people who are, um, you know, in survival drug use patterns, like Kaylin was saying, and, and being that I've, I've been there myself, like, it is really, really hard to have any change in your life when things are that chaotic and when you're feeling that poorly. And, um, you know, it takes mostly for everyone, multiple, multiple times of accessing treatment and different types of treatment for people to have sustained recovery. And some people, you know, may not for many years and some people may pass away, but we wanna give people every opportunity to be cared for, to feel loved, to feel important, to have opportunities to access treatment. Like watching this film and asked me after like, what did you think? And I was like, it was really hard for me to say because like a lot of it just made me smile so much and made me really happy. Um, but it also, I was really happy for those people, um, like just seeing the like sense of community that they had and seeing like people getting visited in the hospital and somebody going into treatment people are making sure they see them there. And the way that like the connections that they had there, it made me feel like really, I want people to have that here. Mm -hmm. And we have harm reduction programs and I think I have really great relationships with the people that I work 
work with, but I just think there's no better way to meet people where they are than bringing people in when they're using. Like people, that is always, there's competing needs. And, and I know from experience that your number one need when you have opioid use disorder and you are not in, in, in treatment and you're having withdrawal and, and any substance use, that's always gonna be the thing that comes first. That is what your brain is telling you needs to come first in order to survive and be okay and to be able to go in somewhere and have a conversation. Like I, I always couldn't, I couldn't go and, and have a conversation about treatment if I hadn't used, I'm gonna be sick. My mind's gonna be on what am I gonna do? I'm gonna be preoccupied. I'm not gonna feel comfortable. I'm not gonna feel like myself. You know, like this is the true way to bring people in to have those conversations. And and yeah, we need it to, to keep people alive and every overdose that can be intervened on is extremely important and is life-saving. But it's also about like, it's damaging. It is damaging for people to feel so not cared for and not cared about. And like in Burlington, it's really frustrating to see like we have so much built up like frustration in our community with like there's public you know substance use going on and people are in crisis and I saw this guy that was having some sort of a fit on Church Street and um, there's syringes here and there and everywhere but also what about an OPC oh absolutely not that encourages drug use like we we you know we have drug use like drug use is a part of our world it is what is going on we are in a crisis people are dying we do have public drug use we do have public overdoses it's traumatizing for the community for the people that are witnessing that and there are people that are professionals that are trained that want to do this work that are asking to do this work and it can help solve a lot of these issues it can help reduce a lot of this in our community so it's really hard to like hear those type of arguments all the time but also knowing that there's a lot of evidence to show that this one thing can respond to so much of that, but then still that that doesn't feel right either. But it is right, and it's just, and it's what's absolutely needed in Burlington. We have done a lot to expand treatment access. We still are a very, very long shot away from where we need to be. Most people do not understand how hard it is to access treatment. Just to get yourself there here, but all of the logistics stuff, yeah. you know, it's a lot. I mean, you have to be on 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 methadone. You have to go at 7:30 in the morning to induct on methadone. 7:30 a.m. If you're not there by 7:30, you can't start that day. You know, like that's a big problem. I know people that have tried for a year and keep missing that window. You know, because they don't have an alarm, because they're in a tent, because they're in a bus. People that went to inpatient treatment seven times in a year and stayed for 11 days and graduated and, um, you know, are coming up to the exact same situation. And if you, don't, if you don't get to the clinic by 11, once you're in, you missed your dose for the day. It's so another day your life is at risk. Another day you're in excruciating withdrawal. Another day you can't step forward. You know, it's very hard. We, we have done a lot, but we are very far from where we need to be. And this is a major piece to helping us get there. So... Thank I, you. I, I thank think you. I can. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just said thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Both I, I think I could just add just a little bit to what uh, Jessica has said that is in direct response to your question. You know, when you look at the history of America, you know, we, we, we're a stigmatizing country. We, we believe in stigma. Um, we support uh, false belief systems. We want to punish and incarcerate. The system is really built on this. It's akin to um, systemic racism. You have systemic stigma. And, and we're, we're just peeping our heads out of that. You have people today that, you know, we've changed our language, we'll say person with substance use disorder. So a lot of us have changed our language, but, but really what's down deep inside, we need to get at that. And it affects everyone. And, and I think it's most evident to your question about why is the governor not along with this? It's stigma. What else could it possibly be? It's refusing to educate oneself. There's a saying, uh, contempt before investigation is ignorance. Governor Scott has contempt for people who use drugs, and especially for an overdose prevention center. It's part of the record. He doesn't believe in it. He's what we call abstinence-centric. It's either you stop taking drugs or 
die. You know, and this comes from legislation around the turn of the last century in America, the Harrison Act, where doctors were forbidden to provide comfort to patients with opioid addiction or opiate addiction. It's this mentality of wait for them to hit bottom, wait for them to suffer so much that going into treatment is their only option. And I'll end now because it, it gets me going. You know, in America last year, we had 111,000 deaths. That's 111,000 people that didn't hit a sufficient bottom according to abstinence centrism. Those 111,000 people are prime candidates for what Jessica and Kalen call harm reduction. We love you. There's no demands placed on you. We're here for you. We have compassion, come. You're so, we love you so much, we're gonna keep you alive while you're using drugs. It's okay. We'd rather have you alive using drugs than dead and abstinent. You know, and that's the sad truth of it. Kellen? Kellen? What? Yes, but we have, we have a saying that the abstinence community doesn't love, but it's that abstinence fails every single time until the one time it doesn't. And harm reduction is the net that catches those people. Um, and abstinence failing can, can look like a lot of different things. It can look like... Um, mistreatment and a lack of compassion and not, um, you know, not managing people's withdrawal symptoms properly. Uh, sort of treatment as punishment is a big thing in the United States. It can also often ends up being quite traumatizing for people and they really fear going back because uh, opioid withdrawal in particular is absolutely excruciating. Um, it could, a failure of abstinence could be that there just aren't enough beds, which I think I heard Jessica talk about, right? It's when you decide you want to give it a go and there's no spot for you, that's a very demoralizing moment. Um, and in that moment, you don't have a choice but to continue your use. Um, and then, you know, the rate of return to use, um, we're moving away from the word relapse now, um, but the rate of return to use for the people that we work with is as, is as high as 94%. That's pretty close to 100, you know, and if you can, if you're pretty sure there's going to be a return to use for this person, who has you know, been through a treatment program that's probably not long enough and hasn't managed their withdrawal or their pain, their psychological pain very well, they're discharged into the circumstances that probably fueled their addiction in the first place. And, and we as a society are, are shocked that it doesn't work. You know, they're not discharged into jobs, meaningful jobs. They're not discharged into housing. They're not discharged to therapists to help them deal with generational trauma and racism and exclusion and all of these things. They're discharged back where they came from with very little support. So this whole sort of idea about pull up your bootstraps and go get treatment and become a productive American citizen is really a bit of a polite fiction and it drives me nuts. Um, and if we are not gonna have broad reform of the treatment system and so many of the other systems that we are asked to be held accountable for, Harm reduction is, is the, all the pressure on us is to sort of defend our work when we ask, what is everybody else doing? We are a part of the puzzle. We never claim to be the whole solution. The four pillars approach requires the other three pillars to be at least semi-functional for us to get where we're going. Um, and yeah, I, I think I said I wasn't gonna pile on and I think I just have, but, but this is, well, yeah, I'm going to pile on now. But Step one for us. <laughs> so, Kaylin, you mentioned the four pillars. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, so the, the four pillars approach uh, is prevention. We also don't really do a good job of that. We don't really know how to talk to people about prevention. Prevention doesn't talk about trauma and generational trauma and poverty and racism and exclusion. Uh, it just talks about sort of... Um, I, you know, sort of a very watered down and generic version of prevention that's sort of Nancy Reagan dare stuff. We haven't really evolved much past that, but prevention is one pillar. Enforcement is a pillar, uh, and that's been certainly broadened to include diversion in recent years, um, sort of restorative justice principles. Uh, harm reduction is a pillar, and then treatment is a pillar. Uh, and the idea is the four of those combined could possibly um, get us through this. Um, but not everybody's at the table with the same intent. 
not as everybody's at the same table with the same resources and the same political backing. Uh, and and that's, that's a little bit where it all falls apart. I want to say one last thing just about the veto and Ed and Jess, don't kill me. Um, the election, the election is a part of this, cold feet because of the looming election. And I, I just wanted to say that the Department of Justice, the feds have visited on point uh, three times now, twice or three times, or very recently, just a few months ago. And every indication we have received from the federal government is they do not want to get involved. They want the municipalities to lead. They have applauded us over and over again for the interventions that we're running in New York City. They get it, but it is not the time for them to weigh in. They don't want to be pushed into a corner. They want the municipalities to lead, whether that's the state or the local municipalities. Um, they don't want anyone to mess up because then they would have to get involved so they want well-run programs, well-designed programs, but we are repeatedly showing that we're capable of doing that as long as there's leadership at the state or local level. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, um, Milo Gran again. I, I just wanted to touch, comment on a few things. Um, so first of all, everyone's familiar with Ben and Jerry's iconic Vermont brand, um, their main store on Church Street. They, after a lot of business had already been closing their bathrooms to the public, they kept it open for a while because in Ben and Jerry's, a lot of families, a lot of kids, we all know what it's like. You ask the kid to go to the bathroom before you leave the house, mm -hmm. but you get outside, you know, you don't, if you're a store having so many families, you don't want to do that. But they had the same problems, unfortunately, with people going into their bathrooms and overdosing. And they finally had to close their bathrooms and they put out a statement that Burlington needs an OPC. So that, that I thought was very, very important. Um, the sense of community is everything. What I have seen, and I am out here at night, I am walking around downtown, I am walking around, I live like 10 minutes from the waterfront, like a 10 minute walk. I, I've been watching this for years now and I see just a large group of people that have become disconnected from the community. And it is one of the reasons that we are seeing um, more quote unquote random acts of violence. When you become disconnected from the community and you feel people are disrespecting you, um, there's just more anger. But whereas when you, when someone reaches out to you, it, it means everything. And, and, and we can change people's behavior by acknowledging their, their existence. Um, their existence, their worth, the the controversy around what our new mayor is doing with regards to the encampment on the waterfront. These people have no place to go. They have no place to go. I'm on the the uh, the group of advisors that the um, Mayor Mulvaney Stanek put together, and we literally in our last meeting over and over again. Well, we've got this. We got. Oh, they got no place to go. We got. They, they got no place to go. They have no place to go. Over and over again, they have no place to go. And so, when someone said to me, um, "You know, we're rewarding them with porta potties," I was like, "Wow, you're looking at a as a porta potty as a reward." I like. I need you to think about that. We have businesses complaining about having to clean up human feces. We, we like, and you're saying we're rewarding them with a porta potty. So we really have to think about this. And with regards to our current governor, I would ask people to look back to Governor Shumlin when he had his state of the state address, like during the worst of the opioid crisis. The mindset is so completely different from Governor Scott's. Governor Shumlin said, this is the issue of our time for our state. He said that what we are doing is not working and we must try new and different things. And, and it worked, things got better. Uh, a little more under control, did not completely go away. And, and now we're in this quote unquote third wave 
I recommend VT Digger. They did a very good two-part series called The Third Wave, explaining what we had before and what's happening now and why it's different. And I am just so discouraged. I do not understand why anyone in Burlington would vote for him. He talks dis in very dis disparaging ways about the city of Burlington. He thinks we're some, some urban, quote unquote. Yes, we are the largest population base, but we are not a urban city. And, and people, I, I'm telling you all, I, I, we have to start to, to talk differently politically. We're not using our political power. And that is a huge problem. And um, thank you very much for letting me speak again. Thank you, Milo. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Leo, a follow up for Milo. Hi, yeah, you were talking about something earlier. Um, and it kind of struck me out, and I want to hear a little bit more about it. And it was saying how you feel that the overdose prevention centers help get people get out of the survival drug use patterns. Mm -hmm. So that's that's not crystal clear to me how that would be different at a, oh, can you hear me? You look like you can't hear I me. I have a feeling she won't be able to way back there. You don't sound that loud. Okay, is that better? There you go, there you go. Yeah, that's better. The microphone's better? Okay, so the question was that you, you were saying earlier how the overdose prevention center helps people get out of the survival drug use patterns. And I was just saying to me that's not crystal clear as to how that's different from other pathways. Like what do you think is different in helping people get out of the survival drug use patterns and into more maintenance? Yeah, that's a great question. I just want to make sure I, I heard the question properly. It's what is different about an OPC that pulls people out of survival drug use patterns in a way that other pathways can't or that's don't? The, that's the question. Is that the question? Okay. It's two things. Um, OPCs don't enable drug use. They acknowledge that it's happening and turn it into a public health encounter and access. So when you allow the one activity that is compelling people to occur, they're going to do that activity with you. When you eliminate the possibility of arrest, provide uh, reliable and consistent access to a clean environment where they won't be policed, around the one thing they want to do all day long, because uh, th that's very much the group of people that we are working with, they're going to vote with their feet and they're going to use their site. They're going to use the site. Our job, when we finally get them in, out of the parks and the subway stations, et cetera, or wherever, the alcoves and public bathrooms in Burlington, our job is to then teach them that they have consistent and reliable access to the space. So when they have their drugs in the morning, say, and normally what they would do is they would get access to the public bathroom that just closed down, and they would say to themselves, I don't know when I'm going to be in a private space again. I'm going to bang this whole bag. And they go down. In an OPC, we can say, what are you doing? You can come back and you're here. You can pack four syringes, you can save three, you can come back in 20 minutes or an hour or three hours from now and do that shot. You don't have to do it all now. You are in a safe place, you can repeatedly come here. There is no limit on the number of times that you can come here. So the way we interrupt uh, sort of problematic dosing that can happen in survival drug use is one thing. The other thing we do is ask people a question that they are very rarely asked. They're definitely not asked this by their healthcare provider. And the question is, what are you trying to do? What feelings are you trying to create in your body? Do you want the absence of physical pain? Are you trying to treat psychological pain? Do you want, are you just trying to have fun? Do you want to disassociate? What are you trying to do? What substances are you using to try and do that? And what modes of administration are you using? Often people don't have a clue what they're doing. So when you start to educate people better around uh, how to achieve the effects they're trying to achieve through their substance use, through whatever pain or whatever state they're trying to manage, you are also coming at their overdose risk and other um, negative health outcomes that way. Again, Overdose Prevention Center is the only place that that happens. 
What we find over time, and our, the first cohort we engaged in November 2021 was overdosing constantly with us. We were catching all of that chaotic use. They didn't believe us about the consistent access. They were doing their whole bag in the morning because all of this is very ingrained in people. I have to rush. I can't be here. I'm going to get arrested. It took time to pull them out. Around the seventh month mark, they weren't overdosing at all. They were planning maintenance use. Some of them had been hired by On Point. Some of them had been housed. It takes time. This is a longitudinal intervention that is built on trust and consistent access. Um, and the other thing I should say, because honesty is very important, is it doesn't work for everybody. Some people stay in survival drug use, but that doesn't mean that their life is any less valuable than the people who have a, a more tangible benefit from the OPC. Let me, let me add something, Leo, because I think it's important. You'll hear in Vermont uh, very often, it's on the uh, state website, and it's like a couple of catchy terms now. Go slow, don't use alone. That's what Kaylin is describing. Go slow, don't use alone, be around people, talk to them. In Vermont, how can we expect, how can we possibly expect someone using drugs to, to, especially the people who are unhoused, they have no place to use drugs. They're looking for a public restroom or a restroom in a, in a restaurant. So using alone, you have to use alone. You don't want to call attention to yourself by having two or three people going to the restroom. Go slow, you have to go fast because you don't know who's coming, who's gonna catch you, who's gonna throw you in jail. So in Vermont, we have this, we're saying kind of the right thing, you know, we have a website and all this kind of stuff, but it, it simply doesn't work because it's got no depth. Kalen describes an overdose prevention center, that's where these things really uh, come alive. I have one more thing to say on that, and also I think like, Using it in those ways in a public bathroom, um, in a public place, hiding at the end of an alley behind a dumpster, that people are <clears throat> rushing, like Ed said, which is putting people at high risk of overdose, but also things like missing shots that are giving people abscesses. And it's also giving people, if people aren't using it in a maintenance way, like Kaylin was saying, then people are having really strong effects that it's not always just about like overdose. It's about like maybe doing way too big of a mess shot in, in getting overdose overamped and overheated and people are having seizures and um and then also getting panicked and getting paranoid and um and then more likely to be in withdrawal sooner again too which also people you know these can cause a lot of issues for people and a, and a lot of issues in the community so just like having people have that safety and like knowledge that um they have a safe place to use whenever they want to like it's it's like there's so many far-reaching things that that benefits you know well thank you everybody uh, do you have any other questions here do i have to fill the space again <laughs> i guess so um so one of the other hats that I wear in the community, I serve in the Church Street Marketplace, which for those of you, you know, it's our pedestrian mall where a lot of our businesses are. And, you know, not surprisingly, there are concerns about the uh, the use and consumption in a public space. And, you know, it just to me, it seems like a no-brainer. It's like, well, you know, these folks are in house. They have nowhere else to go. So, like, what, what would you have them do? So I think, you know, having a place in a supervised setting, you know, that provides the safety net that Kaylin and others have described, I think, uh, would go a long way to address some of, the, of those concerns as well. So... You know, like I said, initially when I had heard about uh, this type of approach, I was very skeptical, but the more I learn about it, the more I continue to have conversations with different people with different backgrounds and learn. It's like, you know, I, I think that's just something that we really need to take a serious look at and give it a whirl here in Burlington. So, um, but the, the other thing too, I, a point I want to make too is, um, not just what you're saying about treating the whole people though too is the physical issues but again that sense of community the mind body and spirit and treating the whole person in kind of a holistic way and i think you know to, sometimes with medical in, in interventions you know we focus on you know the clinical side of things but we don't always focus on the mind or the spirit so i think you know having a program like this would allow folks to kind of you know address some of those other needs as well so um anybody else got a question Yes, you want to add to that, Ed? Please. I can't really hear you. It's out of battery. Out of battery? Yeah. Do you have another one? Um, Yeah, 
Okay. Matt, before we close, I wanna I wanna I wanna thank Kaylin. She's probably not gonna like it, but I wanna I wanna thank all of you, first of all, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come here tonight and be with us. <clears throat> One of the things I've been thinking lately is that compassion is in the heart of the beholder. And and um that's a joy and that's a that's a gift. And you all have that. I would ask you to Spread that around town. See if you can help others to achieve that. The other thing I want to say before we leave is I want to just recognize Kaylin C. I met Kaylin maybe, what, three years ago, maybe. I heard about her. I sought her out. And I had her um, do a, an interview uh, with me. And then over the course of the months, uh, she never, every time I called her, she was there. Never a hesitation to consult with me or answer a question I might have. She testified before the um, um, House of Representatives, the Senate. She was at Comstat. She was on uh, the Addiction Recovery Channel. Anywhere else? The Opioid Settlement, the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee. And um, I just have to tell you, H72 may be overturned on Monday. We think we have a good chance. And we wouldn't be here without people like uh, Kaylin C., one of the most generous people I've ever met. So thank you, Kaylin. Hi. How are you, Ed? I, I, I will say that I, 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 I just adore the entire Vermont community that's been advocating for this, and I'm very happy to do anything I can. And you should know that you, you all are my last speaking engagement as the Senior Director of Programs for On Point NYC before I am leaving On Point uh, to join Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles to help them get some sites open. So um, there is no one I would rather spend my last evening as the Senior Director of Programs for On Point NYC with. And I just wish you all so much good luck and I'll be thinking of you on Monday. And I, I pray you get the outcome you need and you deserve. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Kaylin, on that. And uh, for those of you who are watching at home, the panel discussion here that we're not able to be here for the actual film, the film is available uh, on PBS Passport, um, so you can watch it if you if you want to check that out. So, um, and just to echo what Ed said, you know, you had a choice. You could have gone somewhere else and done something else with your evening, but you chose to come here. So I think that's very meaningful for a lot of us. So thank you for choosing to spend your Wednesday evening and engage. Um, I've always said that Burlington's greatest strength is its people, and I think together, working together, we will find solutions to many of our problems. So thanks again, and uh, this concludes the panel discussion portion of the evening. Jess Kirby will be leading a Narcan training for those who are interested, and if you want to kind of hobnob and talk with Ed, uh, he'll be available as well. So thank you so much. appreciate it, and uh, if you feel inclined, uh, you know, I'm sure that the folks at On Point could use some financial support. So, um, you know, if not, well, give them moral support. Thank you.